Well, good morning, everyone. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes as people get connected here. I'm told that the weather in New York mirrors the weather in London today. So it's just rainy and cold everywhere. So sorry to everyone for that. It's not your fault, Tamara. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? You're in London. I'm, I'm in, in London. York. Nick is, of course, in London. Of course. Actually, just outside London, in fact. But... Fantastic. How's uh, How's Jason doing? Which Jason? Uh, Jason, um, who used to run the New York. Um... Oh, he's doing really well, actually. Yeah. Excellent. And we used to have coffees on the regular because I was running a, um, a UK <laughs> IT company um, doing the same similar sort of thing, you know, the UK office. Oh, right. Event. Yeah, I know. He's doing really well. No, it's good. Excellent. Because he came back really and that was well the last I heard. It's a slightly tricky uh, environment, to be honest, but uh, he's bearing up maybe rather than he's doing very well, but it's quite tough. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, if you do, if you do see him, say Ashley Lucas says hi. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're going to get started. We, I see we have a few more people joining, so I will slowly welcome everyone uh, this morning. Um, uh, I'm Tam Recker, and on behalf of all of us at British American Business, it's really our pleasure to welcome you to today's Accelerate session. Um, of course, featuring Nick Wheeler, OBE, the founder of Charles Stewart. Um, it's fantastic to have such a good turnout for this session. So Nick uh, clearly is doing something right. Um, we'll properly introduce Nick in just a little bit, but first a uh, couple of logistics. Um, so th over the next hour, we'll kick off with um, some opening remarks by Nick. Um, after which we'll roll into um, moderated discussion. Um, and then if there's time for roughly the last uh, eight to 10 minutes, we'll send everyone into breakout rooms to you know, extend the conversation uh, in a more interactive setting. Uh, for, for this portion now, if everyone could please keep yourself on mute and unmute yourself when you like to ask a question or make a comment. Um, Equally encourage you to keep your cameras on, so we we mirror that true in-person roundtable feel, which I don't think we're going to have for some time. So um, we can try virtually. Um, so so with that, um, I am going to hand it over to Roger Barton, who is both the chair of our Accelerate uh, committee and also managing partner of Barton LLP. And Roger will introduce Nick and facilitate our discussion. So Roger, over to you. Uh, thank you, Tamara. Uh, Nick, welcome. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Nick will give remarks, maybe 10, 15 minutes. Uh, while that's going on, please keep the microphones on mute. Following that, uh, we'll open it up to q and I'll do the best I can. I can see, I don't know, about half of you on my screen. So if you can use the chat function uh, for your questions, I'll try to pick them up. Or uh, if you can raise your hand, then I can call on you. We'll get you get you in live. So keep it informal, whatever works best. Um, those of you who have not attended Accelerate before, um, this is our entrepreneurs club within the club of British American business. Um, we meet in the old days for, for dinners and cocktails and you know socialization and with an outstanding speaker like we have today with Nick Wheeler. Uh, and the spirit of this is really to uh, engage with, you know, a star entrepreneur such as Nick uh, and share some ideas among ourselves as to, you know, building a business, managing people and all the headaches and joys that comes with that. Uh, so with that, let me introduce Nick Wheeler, who is the founder and CEO of Charles Turret, uh, which I learned you say like spirit. So there we go. Um, I've been well armed uh, in, in that sense. Uh, Nick founded the company while at university in 1986, which I think is an amazing uh, feat in and of itself. 
Um, the company is, I think most of us know, particularly the men on the call, at least I'm wearing a vintage Charles Turret shirt today, um, is one of the largest shirt sellers. It is the largest mail order uh, shirt business in the UK. Uh, it, it, it employs about a thousand people in, in nearly 30 retail stores, if I've got those stats right. Um, and I'd be curious, Nick, if you would just sort of take us through the journey, you know, from 1986 to today, what, what made you start the company? How did you get to where you are today? Okay, great. Um, yeah, it's quite hard to put 34 years into 10 minutes, but um, I, I can give it a go. Uh, I think it all went back. I mean, I always wanted to start my own business. Um, I don't really know why, but I, I, I remember very early on, before I went to school, actually, I, I discovered that I, I was always a bit of a slow learner, but I discovered that if you put a seed in the ground, out popped a flower. And uh, I remember telling my father that I wanted to grow. So we had these chrysanthemums. I don't know if you have chrysanthemums in the US, but they're a sort of type of flower. And I, and I said to him, I want to grow some chrysanthemums and then let's go and sell them. And uh, I put these seeds in the ground and out popped these flowers and, and, and we harvested, we, we cut them and and he went, came with me before school. We got up really early and drove to Wolverhampton, which is about an hour away. God, it must have cost more in petrol than I got for the flowers. But you know, we got to Wolverhampton Flower Market and I sold these chrysanthemums. And it was like, um, it was sort of like magic. It was a sort of, you know, I, 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 I never quite know whether, you're, whether entrepreneurs are, are born, whether it's nature or nurture and the debate will go on forever. But you know, to me, that was magic. It was creating something out of, out of nothing. And... Uh, and from there, I just, you know, I, I did other little things. I used to go in, in my father worked for an agricultural machinery business. And basically they were what we call metal bashers. They take sheets of steel and they'd bash it into agricultural uh, hedge cutters and, and, and products like that, agricultural machinery. And I'd, I'd go in on Saturday morning with him. This is aged about eight. And I'd, I'd, I'd help him open the post. And whenever we, whenever I open the person found a check, I'd sort of wave it madly, wildly in the air, and then we'd both do a little dance around the table that somebody had actually paid some money to, to turn this metal into, into agricultural arms, or agricultural, you know, digger arms and, and hedge cutters. And it, it was just sort of, um, you know, sort of bred into me. And when I was at school, I, I kept starting, I, I started little businesses. Um, and when I went to university, I started little businesses. I had a Christmas tree business. And uh, I thought I was going to be, you know, I always, I, I started very early on. I had a, an idea that if you did, it didn't matter what you did. And, and in a way, I, you know, I rather wish I'd started Amazon or Google, but because I think I was sort of wrong in terms of it doesn't matter what you do. Um, I chose to do, I chose to do shirts. But when I was doing Christmas trees, I thought, right, I want to do the best quality tree. I, I want to do the best value for money. And I want to offer the great serve, the best service. And uh, so, so I, 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 I found a, a farmer in Wales and, and he sold me a load of trees. I discovered quite quickly I was actually allergic to trees, but I would deliver them to, the, to, to people. Um, I, had, I had people at university with me selling them door to door and then I picked them up after Christmas. That was my added sort of service thing. And I just tried to be, you know, offer something different. And I, and I tried to offer a great price. Um, the farmer who sold me the trees said that you know the needles will never fall off. So I told people that needles would never fall off. And you learn pretty quickly that people don't always tell you the truth in business. And I remember when I used to go and pick the trees up, part, I, I was sort of partly covered in rashes because I developed this appalling allergy to trees. So I was sort of red and yellow blotches and I turned up to pick up the tree, which had dropped all its needles. And I think people just thought, they couldn't believe the cheat that I'd actually turned up and sort of showing my face again. But uh, it still just gave me that, it was the magic of buying a tree for, for two pounds and selling it for 25 pounds, that magic of taking something and selling it for something more. And then I had a photography business and I started a shoe business. Uh, I, 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 I traveled between school and university. I went to India, had these shoes made and I thought I'm gonna have the best shoe business in the world. And they were handmade, made to measure shoes. They were costing me about 10 pounds, which is now well, $13. <laughs> And I was selling them at 50, 50 pounds. And what I was doing is I was tracing around people's feet and then faxing. I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember what a fax machine is, but uh, I used to fax these uh, impressions of a foot to this little factory in India. 
what I didn't realize, I mean, fax machines had gone for a pretty good reason, that they were not very good and uh, not that accurate. But I don't know if you remember that thermal paper, but I sort of put, put, put the measurement, put the, put, the, put the tracing of the foot in at my end on a bit of uh, paper and it would come out on the thermal paper in India you know, it would start like a normal shoe size at my end. And unbeknown to me, it was coming out the other end, sort of, you know, being stretched or shrunk. And uh, I remember I got, I managed to get 50 orders for shoes from people I begged, borrowed, stole orders. 50 orders for shoes. They were costing me 10 pounds a pair. I was selling them for 50. I was going to make 2,000 pounds, which at university, I mean, it was sort of, that was a lot. You know, this was back in 1985, I suppose. And, um, you know, when the shoes arrived, they were shoes for, you know, pixies and clowns. Um, and not a single pair fitted. And I remember thinking, having thought I was going to have the best shoe business in the world, I thought, you know, overnight, I thought, I realized it's not going to work. And, and it's a sort of that thing, I mean, you probably nowadays there's a word for it, you call it pivoting. Um, but I guess I sort of pivoted, you know, I, I thought, you know, I've never been one for doing lots of research. Um, but I thought, what can I do instead of shoes? Shoes is not going to work. And, and I just thought of shirts. I mean, I don't know why it's sort of quite close in the in the in the dictionary. I don't remember going through the dictionary and trying to find the next thing next to shoes, but shirts seemed like a good idea. You know, I liked I liked shirts. Uh, why not? I didn't know anything about them, and I jumped into my little car, and um, and I was uh, went to see this friend, and I said, "I'm starting a shirt business." They said, "How are the shoes?" I said, "It's a disaster. I stopped it. I'm not doing a shirt business now." And they said, "Where are you going to get the shirts from?" And I suddenly thought, "Crikey, that's a really good question. You know, where am I going to get the shirts from? I've got no idea." And they had a friend whose father had a cotton mill in Lancashire who, and I rang him up and I, he said, I can't sell it to you, but go and see my agent. And I just got in my car, drove to this agent in Lancashire and said, I'm going to start a shirt business. And um, he said, oh God, really? And he thought I was just mad, but he sold me a few lengths of fabric. And as I was leaving, I said, and who makes the best shirt in the world? You know, I just hadn't thought it through at all. And uh, I, he said, well, there's a guy down in Essex, which is down... You know, about 200 miles away the other side of London and I and I got in the car straight away and I just drove down to see this guy and I had a few bits of fabric in the back of the car and I said can you make me some shirts and he did and uh, you know off I went with another little disastrous sort of business idea but um, you know that was 34 years ago and I've just stuck at it and, and I think it's a um, you know it's been it's been a really interesting journey and I, and I think for the first four years I did about 12,000 pounds of sales and it just didn't grow, didn't grow at all. And everyone said, Nick, you are just mad. You know, this business has not grown at all. You are mad. You should give up. And uh, it's one of those things, and I don't know how to describe, but as an entrepreneur, you just sort of, you have to believe. You have to have belief in yourself. You have to have belief in your product and you have to have belief in your business. And I just believed. It was a bit of a blind faith, but I believed that the business would work. And, um, it, it, I suppose what I was doing when I was doing £12,000 a year, because everybody said, look, you know, they'd say, go and raise some money. And because and, 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 you're not, never going to build this business with no money. You've got nothing to spend on marketing. You've got nothing to spend on stock. And I said right at the beginning I, that, you know, I, I, I don't want to raise any money. I don't want to give any, I don't want to give any equity away. Um, I don't really want to have any debt. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it long term. And I think, you know, you have a choice when you start a business. You can be what I call a hare or you can be a tortoise. And a hare is somebody who, you know, we all know what a hare is. You know, you go out, you, you, you raise a lot of money. I mean, a hare typically will meet somebody in, in a pub or a bar. They'll be talking about the idea. They'll come out of the pub or the bar and they're already given away 50% for 5,000 quid to the person in the bar. You know, they then run out of money straight away because when people give you money, you lose it pretty damn quickly. Then they go and raise more money. And before you know it, they've got 5% of their business and suddenly, you know, maybe it takes off, maybe it doesn't. And I just always said, no, I don't want to, I don't want to, people say you can have a big slice of a small pie or a small slice of a big pie. And I just said, I want a big slice of a big pie and I'm prepared to, 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 to spend a lot of time doing it. And that's what I've done. I spent 34 years doing it. And I just very gradually, those four years doing nothing, when everyone said give up, I was just really learning the business. You know, and the great thing, I started as a mail order business. And um, the great thing about a mail order business is that it's quite mathematical. You know, you, 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 you have, you have catalogs and you print catalogs. And if you send a hundred catalogs out, you know how many orders you're gonna get. And you know those people who buy, you know when, you know, eventually you know when they're gonna buy again and you, and you can work it all out. You work out the lifetime value of the customer. You work out the uh, customer acquisition cost of the customer. And, and over time, it becomes really quite reliable. You know, you can, you can roll it up. Now I 
ideally you need lots of money to, to build it fast. And I didn't have that. So, you know, I got it going. And from 12,000 to 12,000, 12,000, 12,000, I suddenly went to 70,000, 170,000, 350,000, 1.2 million. And it just started to grow. And it started to grow. And I, I remember, I suppose I just kept it. I always tried to keep it very simple. I tried to keep it just like the Christmas trees and the shoes. I always wanted to give just great quality, great value, great service. And I've always had a, a guiding principle is that I wanted three groups of people to love my business. I, I wanted the people who worked in the business to love the business. And for a long time, that was just me. And I always just loved the business. Uh, and I, want the, uh, I wanted our customers to love the business. You know, I would absolutely bend over backwards for the customers. And I also wanted our suppliers to love the business. And those have been my, that, that's been my sort of mantra, I suppose, over the last 34 years. And, um, you know, I've just, I've, 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 I've stuck it out. And it, it's, it's interesting because it's, I've actually, my wife, you may have, you may know, I don't know if anybody knows the White Company. Uh, they actually have a, a store in Manhattan. They have a store in Manhattan as well. Um, and she did exactly the same thing. And actually one of the best business decisions of my life was when she was just starting. Um, we went on holiday together. And I, and I think it's a great illustration of what you can achieve if you know absolutely nothing about business. I knew nothing about business when I started. She knew nothing. She was a journalist. We went on holiday together. Um, and, and I spent the whole holiday saying, actually, I want to get back to my business. I don't want to be on holiday. She was a bit put out. She said, well, don't you want to be with me? I said, not really. No, I want to be, I want to be with my, you know, back at my business. And um, when we got back, she said, well, actually, I want to start my own business. I want to be like that, too. I want to go on holiday and I want to be, you know, I want to love what I do. She was a journalist with Harper's and Queen, um, and she didn't love what she did. And I, and, I, and I think as an entrepreneur, the great thing about being an entrepreneur is I don't feel like I've done a day's work in the last 35 years, and I've loved uh, every, every moment of it. And so she, she said, I want to start my own business. What can I do? And, and I said, uh, we'd be to see my sister who couldn't find good quality white cotton sheets anywhere. And I said, white cotton sheets. All I really cared about was the business would never be as good as Charles Tirrett or better than Charles Tirrett. And I gave her 5,000 pounds for 25% of the business. Um, she does um, about 250 million pound sales now. Um, and actually the worst business decision of my life was uh, about four years later, I just turned 30. Um, we've been going out for four years and it was Valentine's Day. I took her on holiday again. And I thought we'd be going out for for five years, for five years, I, I, I'm only 30 and it's Valentine's Day, which is talking about. She thought he's going to propose that, you know, we've been going out for five years, it's Valentine's Day and he's just turned 30. When I didn't propose, we got back and she said, she marched into my little office and she gave me my 5,000 pounds back and said, I never want to see you again. So that was the, the worst business decision of my life. But what we've both done is built a business with no debt, no borrowings, no outside shareholders. And it's about just doing doing it over study, being a um, being being a tortoise rather than a hare, and and that's really the, that that's the background. Um, we did two hundred and twenty million last year. We're going to do a hell of a lot less this year. And, and it's I mean the most interesting things about these talks are the the questions. And I've uh, spoken for about thirteen minutes, and and, you, and I can talk about any part of the business you like, but um, you know we have been badly affected by. Um, by by COVID, we're, we're selling, you know, I, I always thought, you know, the great thing is, is that I'm selling, you know, I'm selling work shirts and work suits and work ties for men who go to work. And things might change in the world. And maybe I should have started Dell Computers. Michael Dell started his business just before I started mine, but I didn't. But the great thing is, is that men will always go to work. And so then when I woke up in March and learned that actually men weren't going to go to work anymore, that was a big shock. And it's been a very interesting journey. It's been really quite tough. And we've been, you know, we've been, I suppose pivoting again, um, but it's something that you know, one thing I've learned is that you know you want to focus and be the best in the world at what you do. And what we've tried to do is be the best in the world at doing shirts. And what we what we what we're aiming to do now is to is be the best in the world at providing people for what they what they want to wear when they go to work. And it, it, it's been an interesting time. But I don't want to take up the whole time talking. I was strict instructions to take 10 to 15 minutes. So um, why don't I um, hold it there and, and see where we are with questions? Thank you, Nick. Maybe I'll just start off with a couple, so many running through my mind. Um, and I do appreciate your, your emails that I get saying now, here's your work from home shirts. So good, another good pivot that you've done there. Uh, 
you mentioned, you know, it's interesting that your sort of three stakeholders, your employees, customers, and, and the vendors, suppliers. Uh, and you, if you talk to certainly public companies, you know, the, the number one stakeholder that everybody mentions are shareholders. And it sounds like, you know, as the owner of the business, you, you know, you're, you're the primary shareholder. You don't have that constituency necessarily to, to worry about so much. Do you think that changes your decision-making process, being, allowing you to be more of the tortoise than the hare and try things that you might not try otherwise? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's a, um, it completely changes it. You know, if you, are, if you have outside shareholders, you have a responsibility to those shareholders. I think the day you go down, the day you sell a chunk of your business to private equity certainly is the day you're effectively selling the business because they have a, they will have a, you know, they'll have a, they'll have a fund and they'll have a route out of their fund and they will have a five, six, seven or, or less hor um, yeah, horizon. And, and what I've done is I've said, you know, this is a sort of, um, you know, the, the question people always ask me is when are you going to sell the business? You know, what's the end game? Well, what, what's the plan? And I, my, my answer is always the same. You know, I'm never going to sell this business. I, I, you know, I say, if you can give me one reason to sell the business, I'll sell the business. And the only reason they can ever give you is, well, you can take some money off the table. Um, but if you grow a solid business and, you know, you know, basically we didn't make any money or lose any money in those first two years, even doing 12,000 pounds a year, you know, just, I mean, I lived on baked potatoes and baked beans for four years and got extremely even more overweight than I am today. But, you know, we never really lost money. And it's a... Um, you know, you build a solid business, and over time, you know, I've taken, I've taken money out, and I've taken. To be honest, I've got everything I want. You know, I don't, if, if somebody came along and offered me a load of money for the business, it wouldn't make any difference to my life. You know, what I'm doing here is trying to create something. You know, I, I'm doing what every private equity guy will tell you is wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm become emotionally attached to my business. You know, I have four. We, Chrissy and I, have four other children, but these, you know, the two businesses are, are in many ways, our two eldest children. You know, they're literate. And that sort of sounds a bit trite, but it's, you know, a business is very like a child. When you first start it, when you first start that business, you're spending 24 seven, every hour that God gives you, looking after it, nurturing it, keeping it going, very time consuming. As it grows up, you know, once it gets into its teens, it starts answering back. It has its own views. You know, it has its own, a business has its own team. You can't tell everybody what to do the whole time. And as you change, you know, you become, you get different views. You want new people coming into the business for their own views. And it, and it becomes, it takes on, it's an animal that takes on its own, its own persona. And actually, as it's grown now, you know, there comes a point, and I think as an entrepreneur, there's only one thing you have to do. It's to decide who is the best person to run your business. And, um, you know, I decided, you actually described me at the beginning as, as founder and CEO. I'm not actually CEO of the business. I'm founder and chairman of the business, but I have a CEO in the business. And I've had a CEO for about 12 years. And, and I think one of the most important things is to who is the right person to run my business? And too many entrepreneurs think they're the right person to run their business for, for too long. And, and often it is the entrepreneur that becomes the block to the growth in the business. And I think, you know, when I stopped running the business, what I did, what, what happened is I saw the business really take off. And that, and having said that, we, we, I, the, first, the first CEO I got in was an absolute disaster and I very nearly went bust, very nearly went bankrupt. Um, but the next guy came in and, and it really took off. And, and, you know, as a sole owner without, uh, without outside shareholders, I can do that. You know, I, I have a 50 year horizon here. Um, and I'm 55 now. Um, so I don't know how long I'm going to live, but hopefully, you know, I'll be going for at least another, another 30 years. And that's very rare in business. It doesn't really happen. Yeah. A long, a long answer to a short question. Sorry. Right. I love it. I'm taking notes. Um, Alistair Standing has a question. Alistair, are you? I don't see you on my screen, but you'll pop up. Could everyone who asks a question also just uh, give their company affiliation as well. Uh, yeah, so um, standing architecture. I'm an architect. Um, Charles Tirrett, who is he? Charles Tirrett, what? Who is he? Oh, Charles Tirrett, who is he? That's a good question. Sorry, I should have said that. It's... Um, Charles Tirrett is my middle name. So um, I'm Nicholas Charles Tirrett Wheeler. And it just sounded better at the time than Nick Wheeler shirts. Um, I have to admit, right at the beginning, it sounded actually like a really, I mean, it probably to, to any, I don't know, I, a few of you, I, I think, have bought shirts from me. A few of you have heard of Charles Tirrett. But 
to anybody who hadn't heard of Charles Street, it sounds like it did sound like a pretty stupid name. And I remember when I first, I actually, uh, when I started, I spent the first two years doing it part time when I was at university. Then I went to work for Bain and Company doing consulting, and I did it part time at Bain and Company. But when I went into the office, I, I had my own little office for the first time. I was sitting there all on my own. And at about 11 o'clock, nothing happened. And I'd sent these brochures out. It was day one. And I waited and waited, and the phone just didn't ring. I was call center. I was warehouse. I was accounts. I was merchandising, marketing, buying, everything, sitting on my own. And the phone eventually rang. And I picked it up, and I just said, hello. And it was my sister. And she said, Nick, what the hell are you doing? You know, you've got to say, hello, Charles Tirrett shirts. How can I help you? And I said, I, I can't say it. I can't say Charles Tirrett because it just sounds so stupid. And she said, well, you shouldn't have called your business a stupid name. I mean, if, you know, and she said, I know what I, well, why don't you, I don't know if anybody here has heard of Tyrac, but Tyrac was at the time booming, selling ties. And she said, I've just called Tyrac and they have a little ditty where they go, um, hello, Tyrac adds color to your life. How can I help you? Why don't you do a little ditty? I mean, it, you know, it's slightly embarrassing, but what the hell? And so I thought, oh, God, that's a stupid idea. And I put the phone down, waited for it to ring, wouldn't ring, didn't ring, went off to lunch, had a bottle of wine, which actually made my disastrous little business feel much better. And at about three o'clock in the afternoon, I got back and the phone rang again. And I thought, oh, well, here we go. Um, and I picked it up and I said, Charles Tirrett, adds color to your life. How can I help you? And it was my father. And my father actually, I mean, he thought I was just crazy. You know, I've been doing this business for four years. It hadn't grown at all. He thought I was mad. And I think when I answered, when I when I answered the phone like that, he just said, oh my God, what are you doing? But uh, I gradually got used to the idea of calling it Charles Tirrett. It seemed better to call it Charles Tirrett than Nick Wheeler shirts. Didn't have the, quite the same ring. I wanted it to sound like, Charles Tirrett sounds quite old English. You know, we've got German Street here which in, in, in London, which is a sort of street where, where all the old shirt companies are. And we have a store there. And it sort of fits in quite well. Dave Allen, you have a question? You just answered it, actually, Nick. I was just going to ask where the name came from. So we, we did that one. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do have another one, which is, um, you know, are, are you going to create a, a range of home workwear? Is that going to be the pivot? And uh, I, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, you know, what we try and do, when, when you're doing great quality, great value, great service, one of the issues we have is, you know, I, I mean, I suppose I would say this, but we sell, you know, I know obviously every factory where we make our shirts and I know what shirts those factories make for other companies. And, you know, we're selling a shirt at a, at a, at a ridiculously good price. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know, a, a you know, much, much cheaper than, than, than our competitors. Well, I shouldn't say the word cheap, but a, 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 a better price. The, the problem with that is that we, we're, we're, we're you know, in a supply chain that's very long. So changing our supply chain takes a long time. It's like a big juggernaut. So we, you know, we're working on a season a year and a half ahead. So when you know, COVID comes along, everyone goes home, we're, we're working on autumn, winter next year. Um, and putting the range together for, for, for that. Now, the problem with COVID for us is we just don't know. We don't know what is gonna happen. You know, we know that people are gonna work from home more. And we know some people are gonna work, you know, who are working five days a week in an office are gonna work five days a week at home. Some people who are working five days a week in an office will, will go back to working five days a week in the office. And some people will be working four, three, two, one. You know, it's a complete mixture. So we don't know how the market, you know, nobody knows what's gonna happen. Um, but you're right. I mean, we are, you know, I think what we do well is we, I, I, I think one of our sayings in the business is we make it easy for men to dress well. And it's interesting actually seeing people in this, in this Zoom call, you know, people generally on Zoom look, and this is no offense to anyone, you all look absolutely lovely, but you look a bit scruffy. You know, it's a sort of, you know, you, you don't necessarily wear what you would have been wearing if you'd been going into your office. Uh, having said that, it's nice to see quite a few of you wearing shirts with collars. Um, and I know a couple of you are wearing my shirt, or not my shirts anymore, they're now your shirts, but they were mine. So thank you, thank you for that. But it's a, um, you know, we are, we're looking big time at, you know, because there's certain areas of our business which are doing very well. You know, there's the, the knitwear, some of the pajamas, which we do very, very few of. We do a very, very small range of loungy type wear, but merino knitwear is, you know, doing well. And, and that's what we're working very, Hard to the fast on to to launch because that's what that's what the customer wants and 
you know, we want to make it easy for men to dress well. We want, we want to make men feel good about themselves. You know, men want to feel comfortable in what they're wearing. Everybody does. But I think, you know, men are sort of probably fed up with wearing starchy shirts and, 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 and ties and, 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 and possibly suits. I mean, actually, I, you know, I'm, I'm wearing a suit now. Um, and actually, I quite like wearing a suit, but that's probably, I'm, I'm a representative sample of one on the Zoom call. So that's, that's good to know. It's a bit of market research for me. Um, but absolutely, you know, we're, we're looking to, we want to change to, to, to sell men what they want to wear. Speaking on behalf of the scruffy population who's only worn a suit for 35 years until March, I'm actually enjoying this this time. Uh, Steve Wilson, one of our other always wearing a suit but not always wearing a tie fellows. Absolutely. You Thank question. you. Thank you, Roger. Hi, Nick. I'm a, a partner at Osborne Clark. My other job is number your number one fan. Uh, so for, first time I've worn a, a shirt in eight months, I think, but it feels good. Um, my question is is really around the kind of style, because obviously, certainly within the US, we've seen um, a lot of sort of different generations are becoming more and more casual, even when, when they're going to work. So have you had to sort of pivot your your your, your um, designs to, to kind of go more in the in the casual direction and, and and kind of supplementary to that as you kind of looked at an international um, audience have you had to change your styles according to, to, to where you're selling have you did you do make any changes for, for the for the US market um, we did make changes for the US market the interesting thing with the US market is that it was a much more formal market than the UK market so we have we actually have 42 stores in total globally. I mean, globally is a slightly grand term for it because there we have 14 in the US, one in France, and the rest in the UK. But what we found in the US stores is that uh, what sold well was the formal shirts and the suits. And and the issue with the US is that the US has quite a lot of competition in men's casual wear. Um, so the US for us has been quite hard hit because. Uh, you know, men aren't buying aren't buying the formal wear, and and we are trying. You know, we are we we, we are doing more casual wear. But uh, what we're finding is that, and what we always found with the US is the US man is very. You know, we introduced a new fit, which was a super fit. We do we do a, a classic fit, a slim fit, an extra slim fit, and a super slim fit. And that super slim super slim was really for the US man uh, because there's a big demand for that super slim, more tailored, more tailored look. And another thing which we found does very well in the US is, is, is the made to measure service. So we're doing, you know, made to measure shirts now where you can have, it's not some, it's not a bespoke shirt, but it's a shirt where you can specify all the little details. You can have, you know, contrast stitching, you can have, you know, different, different stripe, di di different kind of thread. You can, you can just mix and match your shirt and it, and it creates something unique. And, and that's something that the US customer really likes. Um, but what we find, what we're, what we're, what we're hoping is that as we move into the loungewear, which we've done, you know, the initial runs we've done in the UK have actually done really well. And we're hoping that as we run those out in the US, that they'll do well as well. But the US is, you know, we all know it's a, it's a, it's an incredibly competitive, uh, com uh, competitive market. And, you know, one of the problems in a way with, with retail now is that, is that retailers very rarely disappear. You know, Brooks Brothers went into chapter 11, and they come out of chapter 11. Everyone goes into chapter 11, they come out of chapter, they lose all their debt, they, they lose all their onerous leases, they come out and, and they continue trading. So competitors don't really disappear like they used to disappear in the old days. So the US, you know, it is a competitive market, but it's, you know, that's good. You've just got to be, you've got to be damn good at what you do. And, and you've got to, you know, it comes back to what I said at the beginning. It's focusing on, you know, particularly focusing on, 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 on the customer. And that's, uh, you know, you've got to give the customer what they want. If you don't give them what they want, they're not going to buy from you. Uh, Nick, we've got a question uh, around attracting talent from uh, John Newell. John, do you want to go forward? Yeah, Nick, uh, John Newell here with Marsha McLennan. Uh, I would say in addition to loving the design and clothes that you make, I also like the attitude that you present uh, from advertising and marketing. And hearing you present, I can feel that in you as well. When you hire, right? So when you went from one person to a thousand, what did you look for? How did you find people that created the same type of spirit that you have? I think it is, I mean, it is the, it is the million dollar question, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know, it, it's the secret of success of every successful business, you know, what you need, if you get the right people into the, into a business, you will have a great business. 
And I think, you know, what we what we've always tried to do is to and what I've you know, I didn't have that many jobs before I before I started Charles Tirrett. Um, I, I worked at Bain doing consulting for two years and, and the only other real job, I had a few, a few jobs at school, but one of the jobs I had was working at Harrods. And when I worked at Harrods, it was a, it was a sort of university summer uh, Christmas job actually. And uh, they put me in the golf wear department. Now I didn't really like golf, um, but anyway, I, that was fine. I went into the golf department. And it's funny how I mean it's funny how little things like this change your whole your perspective and they end up changing your perspective on your whole life and how you think about things in your whole life. Because what happened on that first day is the guy who ran the golfway department in Harrods kept telling me that he'd been running the golfway department in Harrods for 20 years. And you know, he knew everything about golfware and he knew and he was just absolutely fantastic. And at the end of that first day, I said to him, Look, you know, it's really sorry to interrupt you telling me that you've been running this department for 20 years, but and I know you've been running it for 20 years because you've told me about 15 times today. Um, but I've, I just, I've made this list, a little list of 10 things that I think you could do that would make the golf wear department a better, you know, better. And I gave him the list and I thought, wow, I'm just a really clever guy here. This is, I, I might even get promoted on day two. I might become a supervisor. He's going to think I'm absolutely marvelous. And I remember when I came in on day two, it was a bit of a shock to find that I was no longer in golf wear. He put me in luggage. He got rid of me. And it's that sort of... Um, you know, he just had no interest. Now, you know, those 10 things on that list were probably, they were probably 10 stupid ideas. You know, I, I can't remember what they were, but I could almost guarantee that one of them had a little bit of merit. And one of them could have sparked an idea for him that would have changed the way he ran the golf Fed department. And, and when I, you know, I sit down with new starters in the business now, and I always have done, and I tell them that story. And I say, and this is what, you know, what we look for when people come into the business. I want people to come into the business and to, you know, I want people to say, to feel, I want people to genuinely feel that this is their business. And I want them to make a decision. You know, if they make a decision, they, they, they want to make the decision as if it's their business. I don't want people to constantly, you know, refer up the organization, refer to a manager. You know, if I hear people on the phone say, I'll need to talk to my manager about that. You know, that's not what it's all about. It's about saying, look, if this was your business, what would you do? If you make a mistake, that's fine. It's fine to make a mistake, but just... You know, don't make the mistake again. And we'll talk about, you know, I, I had a guy on the phones, this is a while back, who had a customer, he was getting married, and he rang up on the, God knows why he waited till the morning of his wedding, but he rang up on the morning of his wedding, he said, I ordered a shirt from you and it hasn't arrived. You, you promised it was going to arrive. And the guy on the phone said, I'm really sorry about that. And uh, they put it on a, on a, got a motorbike and they delivered it to him. Now, the fact is he was 150 miles away. So the bike was about 300 quid this few years ago. The shirt was 25 quid. And I, and I remember saying, I said, afterwards, I said, hang on, you've just sent a bike for 300 pounds to deliver a, a shirt for 25 quid. And he said, you know, we promised that guy we were going to get him the shirt. We promised we were going to deliver it. He was getting married. And I thought it was the right thing to do. And actually, I couldn't really argue with that. And then I got a letter from the guy who was getting married. And he said, um, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it either. And he said, it must have been quite a boring wedding speech. But apparently his whole speech was about how amazing Charles Tirrett was. So I hope we got lots of lots of orders, lots of orders from it. But it was a, um, you know, that's what I want. I want people who feel that, you know, you know, not to be afraid of making mistakes, to to feel that this is their business. I, I want to. It's about maintaining that entrepreneurial culture, so the customer doesn't hit a. You know, you, we all know businesses where you can just hit a brick wall. You know, computer says no, therefore it's not going to happen. Probably happens less so in the US than it does in the UK, but but there are lots of businesses where that happens, and it's about so it's about finding people with that same attitude, that's that same attitude to to making things happen, to feeling like it's your own business, to being entrepreneurial, and it it's hard. And and I've recruited people where it's been an absolute disaster. I've recruited chief execs that have been a disaster. And as I said as I said earlier, I, I very nearly went bust after recruiting a chief exec, and he took me. And it was an interesting one, actually. I mean, I say, I say, you know, I used to say to people, look, it's fine to make mistakes, but just don't make the same mistake twice. But what I then did is I made the same mistake twice. So it, just very quickly, in 1994, I did go, in 1995, I did go bust. And I went bust because I lost focus. What we were, we were a men's mail order shirt business. And we had a great little business. You know, I'd grown it from nothing. It was doing, um, um, it was doing two and a half million pounds a year, making 250,000 pounds profit, great business. 
but I did what a lot of entrepreneurs do at that stage where you just feel like everything is going swimmingly. This is easy. And in a way, I got a bit bored. And, and more importantly, I lost focus. And I started to look around at what other things I could do. And I ended up buying a little chain of children's clothes business, uh, children's clothes shops. And they had six children's clothes shops. Now, I was selling men's shirts to men by mail order. And I bought a children's clothes shop selling really to mainly to mothers, young mothers. It was, it was young children. I was selling to young mothers on the high street. It was a completely and utterly different business. I lost more money than I made in, the last, in, in three months than I'd made in the last three years. And I, and I went bust. The business went bust. And that was it. And that was a real shock. And I thought, right, focus is what it's at. So wind the clock forward 10 years. I'd gone from two and a half million making 250,000 to 40 million pound sales. I'm focusing on men's shirts, making four million pounds profit. Great little business. You know, it was doing really well. And I sort of... Um, I got to the point where I thought, okay, it, it's now with a lot more people. We were about 250 people. And I thought I'm not the right person to run this business anymore. And I bought somebody in as a chief exec. And he said, I know what we should do. We should sell, and this is embarrassing, but he said, this is embarrassing to me to admit this, but he said, let's start selling women's and children's clothing. And so I went back into children's clothing and God knows what I was thinking, but you know, surprise, surprise, a few months later, I had 9 million quid's worth of stock. I couldn't sell, nobody wanted it. Men don't want to buy. They don't want to buy women's clothing, or not many men do, and they don't want to buy children's clothing. So, uh, you know, it was just a disaster. Very nearly went bust again. So I, I, I made that same mistake twice. So now I say to people when they come into business, it's fine to make a mistake once. It's even fine to make a mistake twice, but just don't make it three times. How do you evaluate, Nick? You know, obviously you're not just selling shirts anymore. So at some point, you, instead of maybe children's clothing, you said, all right, we'll sell suits. We'll sell, and now you know, I know you have shoes. Yeah. Is, is that just a, an easier next step rather than a, a complete pivot to children's clothing or something like that? I, I think it's about, it, it's about focus. And I always remember there was some, I can't remember what the company was called, but I, I got rather fascinated with this company. I think it was in Ohio um, and it was a cement company. And I think they did about $6 billion of sales, but they didn't sell a single bit of cement outside Ohio. And I thought that was pretty cool. You know, they, they said, why would we go outside Ohio when we're still building the business in Ohio? And I, and I think, you know, the men's work, you know, work shirt, work shirt and work clothing market is a huge market. And, um, you know, there's no need to go into women's and children's because we've still got so far to go in, 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 in the men's. You know, there are so many areas that we you know, so many things that we can improve that there's, you know, we're, we're still in the grand scheme of things, we're a tiny business. And I think it's about just really concentrating and making sure that what we sell is, is what men want to wear for, for work, whether that work is, is sitting at home or whether that work is sitting in an office or, or, or out and about or, you know, whatever it turns out to be. And, and I think that's, that's the really important thing is to focus on, decide what you're good at and just concentrate on that. And don't try and do, don't try and be all things to all people. It, it, it very rarely works. Oh, thank you. Uh, David Hiller, you've got a question? Yeah, thank you, Roger. And Nick, pleasure to meet you. You know, thanks for taking the time. Um, sporting a 32-33 slim fit as we speak. So love the product. My, my brother turned me on to it a number of years ago as an attorney. So uh, Great. Well, well, well done. <laughs> uh, question that I had, you know, you're, you're starting to see a, a ton of e-com retail companies spring out of nowhere, right, you know, due to covid I reference that because, you know, some of these companies have little to no overhead, you know, no brick and mortar presence and, you know, are making product that are made to order as opposed to having, you know, inventory on hand. Do you see the larger retail business going down this road, this route sooner and then later? And obviously, how does that, how does that affect your formal wear business? I think, I think what, as I said earlier, we're, we're seeing good growth in, in, in the made to measure side. Um, and we do, you know, doing made to measure online is harder than doing made to measure in stores. Um, but stores have, you know, there's a real problem. There's a real problem in stores. And, and we've seen this, you know, this is not just a COVID thing. You know, you look at the, you know, different industries have a different gradient of graph, but pretty much every industry has online going up and bricks and mortar going down. And it, you know, books and music massively online, you know, went very quickly, very steeply. And other products are going more slowly, but they're still all moving that way. I think what, what COVID's done is it obviously it's, 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 it's tilted all the, everybody's line has gone up. You know, there is a shift to online. And, um, 
you know, we will not have so many stores going forward. You know, we will be looking very, very closely at, um, you know, what stores are doing for us. And, and I think it's going to be, you know, it's very difficult being, being a landlord. I don't know whether there's any landlords here, but being a landlord going forward, you know, as leases come to an end or as companies do chapter 11s or 7s or whatever they're, whatever they're doing, um, you know, it, it, it's a tough time. And we, we will have many fewer stores, you know, where we're, Overall, 70% of our business is online now. Um, and, you know, that will be, you know, in three, four years time, I can almost guarantee that will be at least 90%. I think what we'll do is we'll keep flagship stores. Um, you know, we're, we, you know, we're, we'll obviously have our shop on our store on German Street and we'll keep probably keep one or two stores in Manhattan. But, but we certainly won't have 14 stores dotted around the US. And we certainly won't have 30, you know, 27 to 28 stores dotted around the UK. Um, because there is, there's a, you know, there's a shift online, and and it's a, um, you know, it, it it it's an interesting one. I mean, I don't know how many people here in this audience have gone down the made to measure route, but you know, the, there's made to measure is tends to be quite a lot more expensive. You know, what we do because what we, we what we can do because of our size, which is a sort of a, a bit of a help and a hindrance, is you know we have a shed load of stock and we do shirts in as I say classic slim extra slim, super slim. You know, we have different sleeve lengths, we have different cuff types, we have pocket, no pocket. We have a, a whole host of variations. So you can buy effectively what you're almost buying is a made to measure shirt off the peg. So you order it and you get it straight away rather than, and you, and you get it at a very good price, rather than ordering it from a startup, which is doing what we're doing too, which is doing made to measure where you put your, you put your, your, your dimensions in, and you and you specify what you want, and it goes, you know, it, it ships straight away to a factory in the, probably the Far East, and then it arrives, you know, a week or ten days or two weeks later. And um, you know what you end up with actually is a shirt that is more expensive, and it's not actually a shirt that fits any better. Uh, you know, this is where because we do four fits, you know, it depends what you want. If you if you really want a bespoke shirt, and you don't get bespoke shirts from these start from startups, you don't get bespoke shirts from us. But if you want a bespoke shirt because you like a shirt that is so fitted to your body, it's sort of totally figure hugging, hugging, then good luck to you. But you've got to be a certain shape to get away with that. You know, I couldn't get away. I haven't been able to get away with that for about 40 years. Uh, and, and so what we do is, is, is sort of that we offer that convenience because we hold the stock. Um, but you're right. It, 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 it's a, you know, it's a battle with, 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 the, with the startups. Thank you, Nick. I, I, I forgot to mention, I didn't realize, but I, I'm with New York City Football Club. Uh, same same organizational group that owns Manchester City. So uh, All right, appreciate, yeah, appreciate the time. No, that's great. Thanks very much. Nick, we've got a, a few questions about um, the expansion into the US. Abby, maybe you want to summarize your question and, and Emmanuel's as well. Okay, sorry, Emmanuel. Hi, my name is Abby Greystoke. I'm actually with the British International School here in New York. I'm a big fan of your wife's company and my husband a big fan of yours. So thanks to you both for all that you contribute to our well-being. Um, Emmanuel had asked how the expansion in the US was going and I was sort of particularly interested thinking about Accelerate and the people who are gathered here today to get a sense of um, surprises and key learnings from the expansion in the US. I think we often think that we're very similar um, the US and the UK and it's sort of only when you start to go under the hood that you see how different and what those nuances look like as you try and establish business and grow business in these two markets. So I guess how's the expansion going? Uh, any surprises and any learnings you can share with all of us? Yeah, I think I think the, the amazing thing about the US is the difference between the different areas and the different states within the US. So, you know, when we first we opened our first store was on Madison Avenue and um, and we did a lot of ads in the New York Times and it was very, very New York focused. And then we opened Seventh Avenue and then we opened Sixth Avenue and then we well, we have World Trade Center. World Trade Center is a complete disaster. That was more recent, obviously. Um, but we, we, we kept it very much New York focused. And actually, that was, you know, New Yorkers are different. They're different to the rest of the US, you know, as everybody knows, or, or you guys will know much better than, than we knew. Um, and so, you know, what we then found, and one of the great things about, about online and about direct as such per se, is that as opposed to retail, is that in retail, it's quite a leap of faith. You know, you have to, um, you know, opening a store and signing a lease is, is quite a big commitment. And uh, online, you can test like mad. 
And so we did a lot of testing and we found, you know, Chicago did well. So we've opened, uh, you know, we opened a, a store in the Loop in Chicago and we opened a, a store in Tyson's Mall in Chicago. And we found actually Tyson's Mall did very well. And one of the big things for rolling out in the US is, is finding you've got to, making sure you've got a concept that works well in malls. And in a way, the, 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 uh, the, un, the unlucky thing we did was we tried Tyson's Mall first because Tyson's Mall, for whatever reason, and again, this is, you know, we do have an office in the US and we try to be US focused on, you know, US centric on, in our US office. But, you know, we didn't really understand that for whatever reason, Tyson's Mall was different to a lot of other malls. So we then opened another five stores in five other malls and um, they, have, they have not performed. And um, so you've got to be quite weary of, or wary of, uh, of rolling out of rolling out stores into new parts of the US that you don't really understand, um, because it can be you know for us it's been a, it's been an expensive mistake, and I think it's been I mean it's been particularly expensive because of COVID because now you know our US stores are eighty percent down on last year you know people just men are not going shopping and um, you know that that's been it's been it's been a painful process and. You know, we've got, you know, they're not hugely long leases, but we will come out of those stores as soon as we possibly can. Um, and we're sort of negotiating with landlords and, 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 and all the rest of it. But I think what, what's good in the, what's good, not just the US, but anywhere, we, we operate in, in basically in the UK. The US is actually our biggest market. It's bigger than the UK. We also operate in Germany and, and in Australia. And Germany and Australia are purely online. And the great thing about online is just, it's all about testing. And, and I think that's probably the biggest cliche in, 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 in an online business, but it's just test, test, test. You know, you test stuff and if it works, you can roll it out, but you just do it bit by bit. And, um, you know, it can work very well. You know, the US, as I say, the US is, is, is our biggest market, you know, and, and uh, you know, I launched in the US actually quite a long time ago now, but it's, you know, not nearly as long a time ago as I launched in the UK. Uh, it is a huge market, but it's massively competitive. And um, you know, so it's 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 uh, it's been an interesting it's been an interesting time. Thank you, Nick. You mentioned earlier, you know, the love for the business and, and so forth. And obviously, when you're smaller, you know, the decisions you need to make really can create an existential risk. If you if you get it wrong, you know, you might be out of business. Uh, as you grow larger, you know, little babies, little problems, big babies, big problems, right? Um, yeah. But the big problems, are they ex still existential risks? Are they more of just little shifts here and there? What is it that sort of keeps you up at night in that respect, if at all? I think generally they, uh, they tend not to keep me up at night. Um, but that's partly a sort of, you know, that's, that's the not having debt thing. Um, having said that with COVID, we, we have taken some bank borrowing, but generally we don't really have much debt. And I think, you know, I've been bust once and very nearly bust again, and I know what it's like to be running out of cash, and it's just not a great feeling. And uh, you know, the, both times I I I I went bust and nearly went bust. I I suppose what I was trying to do is I was really growing the business by revolution rather than growing it by evolution. And you know, as as an entrepreneur, you probably you know you, there's an argument that you should grow it by revolution, but actually. You know, I think, you know, and, and maybe I'm just becoming a bit old and boring, um, but you work out that, you know, the best thing to do in a business is decide, you know, decide what you're going to be good at, decide what your focus is. And just every day you are trying to make something in the business better. You're trying to make do something that makes the customer happier, something that makes people work in the business happier, something that makes your suppliers happier. You're just trying to do something better. And it's just, you know, it's about, it's, it, you know, it's about evolution. And it's, um, and I think if you do that, you don't get the big, you don't get the massive, blitzes um and the massive worries um but you don't have the massive step forwards either you know i mean we grew i grew 22 percent every year for for 26 years or something you know, from a from a small base but it was you know good solid compound growth um but having said all that i think what we've now got with covid is just a huge huge unknown you know that decision to sell you know shirts to men at work was was is it, starting to look like not such a clever idea and it, it, it's the not knowing it's the not knowing what men are going to be doing in in one month two months six months a year two years time when i've built a business which has a you know long lead times on the product side you know we you know for a long time we still had suits arriving in containers you know we weren't selling any suits nobody's buying suits 
you know, that's not a good feeling, you know, when you're piling up, you know, we've got a warehouse, I've got a warehouse with a lot of suits in. And I don't know if I'm ever going to sell those suits. You know, I don't know if people are ever going to wear suits again. Um, and so it's, you know, the, the last nine months has been by far, it's been by far the, the it's been, it's been, well, certainly the hardest time since since 2005, when I when I very nearly went bust, um, and 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 obviously 1994 when I did go bust. I mean, just by far, it, it's a completely transformatory um, change in change in the business. And you know, I think if you if you're careful, and I think one of the interesting things actually looking at the business, you know, we did have 1,200 people in the business. We've probably actually now got 800 people in the business. And when we look at different parts of the business, how we're working with 800 people rather than 1,200 people, we're obviously, there are parts of the business which is pure variable cost, packing shirts and boxes or working in stores. And that's, you know, losing people in those areas is just a, a, a really unfortunate fact of life. But we've also lost people, other people in the business where I always had, you know, in Gladiator, there's that sort of, um, there's that picture of Russell Crowe looking sort of quite lean and mean, and we, we had it blown up. You know, it's that concept of, you know, not wanting to become a fat gladiator. You know, you don't want to, gladiators tend to, you know, you get the best gladiator in the world, he goes out, every, everybody kills everybody, you know, it's just easy. And over time you get it, he gets a little bit complacent, a little bit complacent and he eats a few too many beef burgers. And eventually he goes into the ring and he's just a bit too flabby and somebody comes along and kills him. And I think what happens is, what happened in, in, in however hard we tried to make sure that didn't happen, that happened in Charles Tyrion. And so we've, you know, we, we've had to make people redundant in the business, in, in buying and merchandising and other areas of the business that are not variable cost. And I think what I hope will happen is that when we come through this, when we come out of this, we will be a much better business. We will be a leaner business. We will be less of a fat gladiator. Um, but I think you have to, you know, there, there are things that happen in life and, and, and COVID is one of them where However much you scream and shout and complain, you know nobody's going to a feel sorry for you or, or b come to your rescue. You've got to you've got to do it on your own, and you've got to do it your own way, and you've got to do what you think is right. And it's really important to change the business because the world is changing, and uh, it's 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 a big wake up call. Um, but that's been uh, it's been an interesting interesting few months. No doubt. I think Emmanuel has a question, and maybe that'll be the last one because we're coming up on time. Actually, it was uh, mostly answered already, but thank you so much for having me on the session. And the final mini question is, did you already have a client base when you went to the US or did you, as you say, went straight in, open a store and then hope that people would pick up um, the product? No, no, I think that's a, that's a really good question. No, we absolutely had a client base before we went to the US. So we were doing, mm. we were doing uh, mail order before we opened the store uh, and um, and what we found is when we opened the store, it really helped the, the mail or I call it mail order, I'd now call it online, but this was pretty much almost mm -hmm. in the days pre, pre online when we did, you know, lots of inserts, uh, which is, you know, many magazines in, in, in the New York Times and, and, you know, the Economist and the FT, the sort of, you know, the US editions. And uh, so we were sort of, you know, appealing to mm -hmm. slightly Brit British expats, but, but equally, you know, we were starting to get a lot of US customers. You know, who love the you know love the look and feel of the shirts, but mm -hmm. I think yeah, really important. I'd never jump in with a retail store before testing the market. I, I'd never jump in with any big capex without testing mm -hmm. without testing first. And online does let you do that. Good point because I think there's still a number of firms out there who do that, who go in hoping that people would just pick up the product without an existing client base. So thanks so much for your comment. Yeah, well, there's a lot of business. I mean, it's sort of the private equity thing. And I've seen so many, well, we've all seen so many businesses coming into this space. They do a little yeah. bit. You know, they, they, they put a presentation together on the back of an envelope. They go and raise $30 million and off they go. And, and then for the next two years, three years, they burn through the $30 million and then they disappear. Exactly. And during that time, they've lost a load of money. They've taken a load of business from anybody else out there who's trying to, trying to, trying to run a, a shirt business. And it's, it's a pain, but that's life. Um, and, you know, in a way, luckily, you know, most of them do disappear. Um, and, and there's a lot of businesses that haven't disappeared, but, but they've never made any money and, and they never will make money. I mean, it's a sort of, you know, we live in a strange world. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I think this was great. We could go another hour at least, but we won't take up your time on that. Thank you so much. Tamara, back to you. 
Thanks, Roger. Um, Nick, a huge, huge thank you for, for your candor, for your humility, for your stories. Um, it's, it's so important for our members to hear from, from you, um, a fellow member that you know really does embody um, the spirit of British American business. So thank you so much for that. Um, you mentioned your wife. Uh, the White Company is also a member, and we're hoping to host Chrissy um, for one of these sessions in 2021. Um, until then, I think our next session will be a virtual happy hour. We've tried it once before. It uh, had some good reviews, so we're going to try it again. Until then, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks to Nick. Roger, see you soon. Great. Thank you very much.